Welcome to Three Count Commentaries. Let us talk about Chris Adams' Dark Side of the Ring, a truly dark side of the ring. My goodness, I didn't know Chris Adams was such a terrorist. Um, <clears throat> I really don't have a lot to add from the Chris Adams' Dark Side of the Ring because everything's in here for the most part. Uh, it's it's truly an interesting thing to watch his career just hit these skids after, and all the legal troubles. Like I didn't know he was in legal trouble this much. And then he was in legal troubles more than the documentary led on because they didn't even mention his T this two DUIs. He said, I don't remember. He was arrested for DUI twice. Like the guy was arrested for domestic violence. He had two DUIs. He had been arrested for assault when he headbutted the co-pilot. Um, he had got arrested for the death of his girlfriend who uh, overdosed on GHB. I mean, it, is, it ended up being a truly sad episode. And you see that the world-class championship wrestling curse is real. Pretty much anybody who made a profit in that venture from a wrestling standpoint, ended up suffering a fate nearly worse than death. Either they committed suicide, they overdosed on drugs, or they were murdered. I mean, it's it's absolutely insane when you consider literally, I don't want to say literally all the top guys, but so many of the top guys, all of the Von Erics, you know, all but one committed suicide. Gino Hernandez died from a drug overdose. Rick Rude had a heart attack at like 40, all right? This Chris Adams was 46. He got shot by his best friend. A guy who was one of the best men at his wedding killed him. There was something going on in Texas where it was absolutely just not a good time to be a good wrestler. Um, just, I don't know, did they were they doing voodoo or something? Did they have to exchange their souls for success or something down there? How could one promotion create so much chaos? And it was such a good show to watch. It's just so much fun to watch, too, by the way. But um, let's get into this episode. Um, his, his children was in this. Well, he has, I think, two daughters and a son. Um, his oldest daughter from Jeannie is in this episode. His son is in this Um and they, of course, his daughter says that she's trying to defend him because somebody has to. And then they give her absolutely no opportunity to defend him because most of the stuff that he does is indefensible. Uh, an interesting bit in here is that Chris Adams' brother is in here. And my thing, is, I, I, to skip straight to the end, Chris Adams' brother saying that he didn't believe Bure, the guy who shot Chris Adams, that he was in fear for his life. You know, he'd say he didn't believe that. But when you look at the pattern of behavior from Chris Adams, especially when he was drinking, that he, you know, attacked his wife while he was drunk. He attacked a pilot while he was drunk. He, you know, had a history of attacking people and starting fights or whatever while he was drunk. It stands to reason that he would probably attack a guy while he was drunk. Now, do I believe that his eyes were glowing with some kind of like some kind of mystic beast? Probably not. But uh, it was. It stands to reason that if a guy is a mean drunk, and he's a he has problematic behaviors with alcohol, that he did cross the line. Now, in my little extra readings, I did learn that he was charged with felony manslaughter for the death of his girlfriend, Linda, in April of 2000. Now, under Texas law, he was charged with manslaughter because they believed that they could argue that his behavior was reckless. And I read some articles and his defense was going to be that Linda voluntarily engaged in the GHB and she took it of her own free will. And it just so happened that she died. That it wasn't his reckless behavior. But I could foresee, perhaps, 
the prosecution making the argument because it was pretty well known that a few months before Linda and Chris, they both overdosed at the same time, except Chris woke up and she didn't. That Chris had actually overdosed a couple of months before that on GHB. So it was something that he had used so often that he had overdosed on it. And then he and her together overdosed on it. And um, he died before it went to trial. He was murdered before it went to trial. And here's another interesting bit that I learned from doing some extra reading. Is that he was actually suicidal after she died. Um, there was quotes in newspapers that says that, you know, Chris um, started having what they would call Linda attacks. Which is basically he would have a guilt trip over Linda's death and he would want to die too. And it, he was even quoted in one of these articles as saying that he wanted to die with Linda. And the only reason he didn't die or didn't kill himself is because he thought of his children. So it was, it was really sad, but it took about 16 to 18 months to get this guy arrested under the belief that he had slipped her some GHB and that caused her to die, but he had overdosed at the same time. So it's a very difficult scenario. Um, and he didn't go to trial on this. He didn't beat the case because he got murdered in October, 2001. So April, 2000, his girlfriend dies. He gets arrested for it in August and he gets killed in October. So, and in, and in between that time, he is, facing crippling depression and he's drinking even more he's almost drinking himself to death at this point and uh that's frightening what a terrible end to a life i mean he spent the last almost two years of his life in in depression and alcoholism like that's horrible no matter how bad you think a guy is geez that's tragic you know he's been just drug through the mud at that point. The story that uh, Boo Ray told about killing Chris Adams uh, was, it was very dramatic. And the way it was told is that Chris Adams just snapped and started strangling him and was trying to kill him. And Boo Ray felt the only thing he could do to get away from Chris was to grab his gun and shoot him. In all the articles that I've read, it says that the two guys were drunk and they were roughhousing. Basically, they were wrestling. Now, where this occurred keeps kind of going back and forth because they never really established whose house this was they were living in. Like, they said it was Boo Ray's house that Chris Adams was living in. But there's newspaper articles that are saying it was Boo Ray's mama's house that they all were living in. So... Who knows, you know, and it's a, it's an interesting bit anyway, but apparently all of these adult men were in there drinking, having fun, they're best friends and, uh, they get, they get to wrestling, but you know, Chris Adams is a mean drunk and, uh, maybe things ain't going his way. Maybe he's having one of his guilt trips about Linda or whatever, and he gets serious and, uh, Boo Ray gets scared and shoots him. That's. An insane story. Everything around Chris Evans' criminal career is just blowing my mind. Of course, it also blows my mind that he introduced his, I guess, baby mama, ex-girlfriend, to Steve Austin, who was his student. And then Steve Austin marries the, the lady and ends up being the stepfather of Chris Adams' daughter. I just, whoa. That was crazy. Now, here's the weird thing. <clears throat> that was the only, that's the thing I thought was going to be the most uh, controversial outside of Chris Adams being shot because I knew he got shot and killed. But I was like, okay, they're going to spend some time talking about the Steve Austin thing. And they were actually, they didn't, it didn't get as dirty and grimy as I thought, it was a simple situation where Chris set it all up. He controlled everything with all, what everybody was doing. He made sure that, you know, it worked out and it was professional. And 
it just gave me such Chris Benoit Taskmaster vibes. Like when he put, you know, Benoit with Nancy. It was like, oof, you know, that was kind of weird, man. I don't know why you would do that, you know. And I'm sitting here trying to put together sort of a a clinical view of Chris Adams, you know, Be- because he's such an interesting case study. You have a guy who comes over to the United States, he becomes fabulously wealthy. Um, he almost immediately runs to the top of a big time wrestling promotion. He's owning his own home in England. He's got a condo. He's driving Corvettes. He's just living the high life. Um, at the same time, his tag team partner passes away. And the tag team partner is very young. And this is 1986, you know, where Gino Hernandez dies. And also in 1986, he headbutted the co pilot in Puerto Rico and got arrested and made the company look bad. And then he really doesn't have much going for him because world class is starting to slowly uh, fall apart. He's still there for the for the later years. So at least he's got a job. He's making some money. 1989, he gets arrested for domestic violence because he he beat up his wife. And then, you know, the company goes out of business. He can't find work for a while. You know, his girlfriend who he was dating for eight or nine years or whatever, marries his student, runs off, and he tries to make the most of it by working an angle with them. And even then, people are kind of like, yeah, he was very controlling and was kind of jealous, especially when we jumped ship and left to WCW. And the, the, the school goes out of business. So he has one really well-known student, and then the school pretty much closes he spends most of the 90s bopping around the independence before he finally gets a job in wcw where he's treated like trash the entire time because he's a he's over the hill at this point in like the mid 90s and then we get into the late 90s early 2000s where he meets linda he falls head over heels in love with linda wants to marry linda then linda dies of a ghb overdose that was his fault because he had been using GHB for years. He had overdosed on GHB a couple of months before they overdosed together. He falls into a depression after she dies. Alcoholism grips him, takes him over. And then he gets arrested for the crime. So put your, put yourself in that, that st- those shoes where mentally you blaming yourself you got this guilt trip because this young lady is dead because of you and he's 15 years older than her by the way he's 45 she's 30 and now this young lady is dead life cut short because you like doing drugs and her little body couldn't handle it and then the law shows up and says well it's your fault this woman is dead and you're like wait a minute That's what you were thinking already because you got that guilt trip going. But at the same time, you're like, legally, no, I'm not responsible. She voluntarily did it, you know, and this stuff's in the news because you were at one point a celebrity and you've been arrested for manslaughter and alcoholism and guilt and anger. And then you finally, your best friend guy who was the best man at your wedding let you live in his house without paying for anything shoots you in the chest kills you i I can't imagine I, i cannot imagine how terrible his life was at the end there it seemed like he hit a skid after that wcw thing where it just never went well and uh i read an article where His children are all over the country. Like, it wasn't like, because he had two, you know, Jeannie, who was, you know, Stone Cold's wife. I think she had taken the baby and went back to England. And he had, his son was in Detroit. And he had another uh, daughter in Colorado or something. Like, he just, he didn't have a solid support system. He was in Texas this whole time. So, you know, he didn't have access to his children. He didn't have access 
to anybody who cared about him, except for the one person who did care about him, who let him live in his house for free, and that's the, the guy who shot him. So, man, I can't imagine. That's one hell of a story. It's a really sad story, too, man. What did you guys get out of this? Like, share, subscribe. I'll talk to you guys later. Peace out.